What a new virtue this month, uh, it's integrity, choosing to be truthful in what you say and do. And our reading that we're going to be looking at this morning is from the book of Daniel. Um, we, need, we need a bit of uh, context to this because we're starting off the sermon on integrity about having integrity when you eat your vegetables. I kid you not, that's what the reading is about. Now Daniel had integrity with vegetables, your preacher can't. I mean, for me, vegetables is a hamburger all the way, or some pico de gallo with uh, my Mexican food. Maybe the odds freshly steamed broccoli, but um, that Daniel made this pledge is pretty amazing, in, at least in my eyes. So, uh, the context as to why veggies are such a big deal in this passage is because uh, this nation of Israel that was split between Israel and Judah slowly went into captivity. They were, uh, Babylon took them over. And this story of Daniel takes place when uh, Daniel is serving in the court in Jerusalem and he uh, is taken into captivity into Babylon and he then has to serve in, in that court. Um, there's a reason why he rejects their food. There's a twofold reason why he rejects their food. Uh, the Babylonians did not keep laws like the Jewish people did when it came to eating meat. So Jews would not eat pork. They were told not to eat pork and they didn't eat horse meat. Babylonians did both. So in terms of what was declared as meat that would be fit to eat, the Babylonians didn't uh, adhere to that and Daniel didn't want to compromise. There's also in this passage a reference to the food coming from the king's table. And it was well understood in those days that uh, you'd be accepting some kind of obligation of loyalty to the king if you ate off the king's table. So that's the second reason why Daniel doesn't partake of the food. So it's Daniel chapter 1 and I'm reading some select verses in Daniel 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service, now this is the Babylonian king, to bring into the Babylonian king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed and quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission to not defile himself in this way. Daniel then said to the God whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare the appearance of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and he tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. That's not my experience with vegetables. <laughs> that is not my experience with vegetables. So the God took away their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kind. This is the word of our Lord. So in ancient China, uh, surrounded by many different lands, the Chinese decided to build the Great Wall. The Great Wall would be there to stop the, those who were trying to take over the lands from coming in. That was the theory. So they built it long, thousands of miles. They built it high, probably about the ceiling of this church. And they built it wide, probably whatever 20 feet is, probably to about here. The belief was that the wall that high, would, unable, would people would be unable to climb. And a wall that thick would mean that a cannon could not shoot through it. 
And so they settled down and they enjoyed life, believing that the enemies would not be able to breach this wall. In the first hundred years of them having that wall up, that wall was breached three times. How they did it was twofold. One way was that people would bribe the gate guards and the enemies would come in through the gates. The other was that the war wasn't continuous. China decided, just like our border wall, that in places where the land and the terrain was very, very tough, you don't put a wall up there because people can't cross the land. Well, the Mongolians did. They found a way to cross that rough terrain and to reach the borderline to get across the border. I tell you the story because our life is one that needs to have integrity. And integrity is essentially a wall that you have around your life. Everything of who you are and what you believe, what your values are, what your understanding is in life and your faith is around, surrounded by this wall of who you are. And our struggle is to keep those things inside of there because there are plenty of people in life and plenty of things in life, material things often, that want to breach that wall, that want to sneak their way in. They want to bribe the guard at the gate of the door of your life. Integrity is to have those values and standards and beliefs within. Then there are plenty without who will want to get a say in your life, who will want to bribe the guard at the gate. There are plenty of times when we think in our lives, I've got this together. I know what I stand for. I know what I believe. I don't need to put a big wall in that part of my life because I'm uncompromising on those values, on those virtues, on those beliefs. That part of my faith is strong. So I don't need a wall there. That terrain is secure. We don't put up a wall and all of a sudden we find ourselves facing compromises that we never thought we would. Or facing decisions that we didn't think would be so difficult. See, Integrity is a difficult one to deal with. Integrity in our own lives is tough because it's so easy to neglect and so hard to keep up. There are plenty of places and those of you, you high school guys, you're going to find that as life goes on, you'll have more and more opportunities to compromise what's inside of those walls. More opportunities will come at you. Different voices will come at you. Wanting to take ownership of the land that is within what you have set up in your own life. So the struggle gets harder. And it's a struggle with all of our lives. You see, integrity doesn't just apply to certain parts of our life. Integrity applies to our whole life. Integrity should be part of the wall that surrounds our entire life, everything in life, all that we decide. That involves integrity. Integrity is something within and something on the outside. So when we speak about the whole of life, integrity is not just about what you believe in, the standards that you hold and, 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 and the faith that you hold. It's also how you share those things and how you live those things out in everyday life. Yes, integrity is being honest with yourself when you're on your own. It is who you are when you are on your own. But integrity is also how you exercise your life when you are with others. Integrity means doing the right thing even when no one's looking. And integrity means doing the right thing when everyone's looking. Integrity involves the whole of our life. It means living the way that God wants us to live in the whole of our life. In who we are as individuals and who we are as people in, this, uh, in, the, in the public eye. In pep, in, in integrity means that we're going to be truthful in what we say and do, not just to others, but to ourselves. That's the struggle, is often being truthful with ourselves. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But truth, being truthful with yourself is a key part to making sure that the wall doesn't get breached. When Daniel and his friends were captured by the Babylonian officials, very few people would have known that they were going to go serve in a high court. Very few people would have known whether or not they compromised their faith. But for Daniel and those guys, it was important for them to live the life that they believed in. And this wasn't just a legalism issue. We'll expand on that in a bit of a moment. It wasn't just following rules. 
It was the essence of who they were. So even though their fellow Israelites probably wouldn't have known where they were, it was important for them to still hold true to their beliefs in the place that they served, in this land where they were being held captive, in a land where people had no respect for the Jewish faith. So this wasn't just an issue of what they believed, it was an issue of how they lived. But they decided to stay true to their faith. They knew what was right and they decided to stay true to that. And that's the challenge of integrity. It's deciding what's right and staying true to that with our own selves and with others. Again, the theme continues, even though we're in a different virtue, it continues with what we said the last two weeks. This is about faith being applied in our everyday life. Not just certain parts of it, not just in certain moments. It's about the wall that surround our, surrounds our life every day of our life. So where are we vulnerable? Who are those great gods in our lives that can easily be bribed and we suddenly find ourselves compromising ourselves? Where are those areas in life where we felt so sure that we would not, we would not waver on that kind of decision? And then we find that we are. Our challenge is to be aware of our inner self and outer life. That's what integrity is. Being aware of your inner self and your outer life. It's a challenge between what, what, what the rules are, what the legalities are, which is what Daniel faced. He could have just done that based on the fact that that's what Jewish law said. But friends, rules and laws don't necessarily make up integrity. It certainly can be part of it, but the integrity is more than the rules and the laws. That's why so many people struggle when they go away from college or they move away from home to go and, and, and uh, explore their career. Because it's not just the rules of the house that apply anymore. It's your inner belief in them. It's where you stand with them. It's how important they are to, how important those values are. So rules and regulations and legalities are not the, just the simple key to having a life of integrity. It spills over into so many things in terms of who we are and what we believe and whether or not God fits in our life and how God fits in our life. It's about being aware of the soft spots, the gates that can be walked through in our own lives. And that isn't just necessarily a thing of listing rules and obeying them. Sometimes people can seek to compromise the rules that we hold near and dear, the things that we have valued for so long, as we seek to explore our own selves and our own individual beings. So what does the Bible then say about how you structure that wall and things within so that you can remain true to yourself and remain true to those who are outside of who you are? Well, we need, a, we need a little bit of explanation here. So, the scripture passages I'm going to read are going to speak about the condition of the human heart. It's because the Jews believed that the heart wasn't just a thing that kept your body going. They knew that. It was a physical thing that kept your body going. It wasn't just a seat of emotions, which we still speak about today. We still speak about feeling from the heart. The Jews also believed that, that was, the heart was the place where you made your decisions. That's where you decided on matters in life. That's where you held your values. That's where your will was, where your desire was, whether you curbed that desire or not. So the heart was involved with things that give us integrity. The decisions we make, the choices that we make. So when we read these readings and we read the word heart, please understand that the Jews are using that as a frame of reference for making decisions. So the first one comes from the prophet Jeremiah, and it comes with a very loud warning. The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? So friends, sometimes the God that we have struggled with at the gate is, of, is ourselves. Because the heart is deceitful. As human beings, we can justify our own behaviors. Often we seek to find a way to do that. I can be all right. Or in our quietness, we think, eh, nobody will notice. It's just me and a couple of guys from the court in Judah, now we serve in the court in Babylon. Who'd know? So, what Jeremiah is trying to say is that we can be deceitful with ourselves. Sometimes we can cheat our own selves. Sometimes we can compromise our own values. Because what the heart wants, 
can corrupt what the heart should be doing. Our intentions and our, 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 our things that we aim at in life, that we say, this is who I am, can be compromised by our own selves. Jesus reinforces that in the Gospel of Mark. He gets a lot more specific. It's from the inside, from the human heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual sins, thefts, murders, adultery, greed, evil actions, deceit, unrestrained immorality, envy, insults, arrogance, and foolishness. All of these things come from the inside and contaminate a person in God's sight. In other words, it breaks our relationship with God. But Jesus is warning us. Sometimes are, are the things that threaten us the most in our own lives and who we are and what we stand for is our own selves. But there's hope. There is hope. So from the book of Proverbs, it says this, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for, for from it flow the springs of life. Keep your heart. In other words, guard your heart. Guard what's going on in life. And that's not just up to you and I, because why? We can be deceived by our own selves. But the point is that from Proverbs is it's saying, treasure the things that are inside of the wall that are in your life. Fight for them. Stand God over them. Not on your own. Not on your own. But with God. And so we get into the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel says this. These are God's words shared with him. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall become clean from all your uncleanliness. And from your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So this is about fighting for our own selves and our own values and our own integrity with God. Because God says, I can help you re-look at things. I can help you reshape things. It's not just a matter of being aware of the rules. That's part of the Ezekiel passage, yes. And those are things that God has given us. But it's also being aware of what's going on in your own heart and allowing God to change that and shape that. He uses the word, with, with water I will cleanse you, I'll give you a new heart. Which is certainly a celebration of our baptism. But we're about to celebrate communion. It's the same thing. It's Christ being able to cleanse us. It's our being able to say to Jesus, I look and see what you did for me on the cross. I need help in my own life because all of God's people have got problems. I need your help, Christ. I need that, 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 that new opportunity. I need a fresh perspective. I need a new way of doing things. So through God's Spirit, through God's work within our lives, we are able to find integrity. Through God's work in our lives, we are able to find a strengthened wall. This is about all of life, but it's also about all of God. And all of God in all of our lives. Let's pray. God, we need to start off with a place of being aware that your desire for our own lives is one where you wish to help us, not condemn us. Where you wish to build us up, not destroy us. Where your desire is that we would have a better ability to make decisions and hold true to the things that are valuable to us. So God, would you help us in the decisions that we make, in the values that we hold, in the thoughts that we find ourselves in. God, I pray that your spirit would speak more and more loudly and that we would give you room, room to grow in integrity. In Christ's name, amen.